Thank you, Mr. John. And no, we're not going to be talking about Harry Potter tonight, just in case it looks like we are. Heard about this guy who uh, goes to the optometrist and he's fitted for glasses, first glasses he's ever had in his life. And um, so as the doctor is doing the final fitting, the man says to the doctor, uh, will I be able to read now? And the doc said, oh, sure, sure, you'll be. He said, well, that's good because I never could read before. <laughs> Here's another one you might not care for. <clears throat> this guy was telling his friend, he said, um, I see spots. I see spots. Uh, and his friend said, have you seen a doctor? He said, no, just spots. <laughs> that's the best I got. I mean, hey. And, and that, But I've got some good news for you in that... Um, since several of you have been here since before 5 o'clock, I, I, I planned a, a shorter sermon for you tonight. And so let me ask you to go ahead and, and turn to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to get there in, in just a moment. Colossians chapter 3. We're just going to do a little bit of uh, scriptural analysis and, uh, and, and see some good points from Colossians 3. I'm actually going to start in another passage, which we'll go to in just a moment. This is Dr. Michael Turner with me. He was on campus Thursday. Uh, We invited him to come and and, uh, speak in chapel and to just have lunch and to spend some time together. He's the president of Ambridge University. And there he is in chapel. And we gave him a a taste of Florence uh, basket and all that. And he had a good time. And we had a good time with him. His first time to be on our campus and uh, first time for some of our people to meet him. Of course, uh, Eric knows him well. And I guess you do too, Scott, being a, an Ambridge alumnus. And so uh, uh, we, we uh, enjoyed uh, some, uh, some good strategy about how we can work together and, and uh, be a blessing to each other as, uh, as institutions. Okay. This is... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. That's where I know I said Colossians 3, and that's where we're going. But let's first of all go to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. When I was a kid, there was a number of, uh, of, uh, of wonderful women who, uh, who were blessing to me. And uh, I've talked some about not only, of course, my mom but uh, and some of my aunts. But uh, also I think about my... Um, my best friend, we grew up together, we wound up marrying sisters, and I spent a lot of time in his home. And my dad worked for his dad for many, many years, and I ate many a meal uh, in, uh, in, in her home, my best friend's mother's house, and stayed a many a night there. But she had this habit, if, for instance, when I was a kid, if I would say something that was a little bit outrageous or whatever, she'd say, listen at you. And see, she was kind of helping me. And then if I would do something that was maybe a little bit stupid or clumsy or whatever, she'd say, look at you. In other words, she was saying, look, look at yourself. I mean, pay attention to what you're saying or what you're doing. Look at you. Listen at you, she'd say. And so uh, I kind of had, uh, when, I, when I put this sermon together, I, uh, uh, I, I, those memories came back to me because she was sassy and bossy. And she was good for me. And I knew she cared about me. And, and as a result of that, she cared about the kind of person that I turned out to be. So when I wasn't under the supervision of my mom, and I was in her home, and I was under her supervision, she was always t- checking me and saying, look at yourself, listen at you, uh, listen to what you're saying, or how you're saying that, or whatever. You know, and, and that was a good thing. Well, the Bible gives us a similar admonition in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Listen to this. Examine yourselves. And see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. In other words, are you living the Christian life? Check yourself. Look at yourself. Um, Are you uh, maintaining a faithful relationship with the Lord? And so uh, the scripture basically is saying here, let's look at you. And let's examine to see whether or not you are in the faith. Okay, so with that in mind, 
I, uh, I thought we'd go to Colossians chapter 3. And again, I'm just going to kind of run through this quickly. I realize we could spend a lot more time on this if we wanted to, if we chose to. As a matter of fact, you could take Colossians chapter 3 and uh, there are at least four sermons here. Uh, here's one of them. Look at where you are now. Where are you? He's saying to the Christians at Colossae. So he says in the first four verses of Colossians chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. So he says, where are you now? You've been raised with Christ. And how did that happen? Well, it happened just like he teaches the Romans in Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. You were baptized into Christ. And when you were baptized into Christ, you were raised to walk in newness of life. And so look at where you are now. You are in a new place. You're not where you used to be because you've been born again and you've been raised with Christ. And therefore, he says, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, I want you to have and and basically saying you do have a new mindset. You're in a new place and therefore uh, you have a different set of priorities. Kind of like what Matthew says in, what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, be concerned about kingdom things. And, be, uh, and, and, and allow your allegiance to be to the king who, of course, is Jesus. And he's sitting on the right hand of God. That simply means a place of honor and authority and power and glory. That's where Jesus is. And so he said, set your sights and your eyes on and hearts on things above. Verse 2, set your mind on things above. Set your hearts, set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things, which of course, that simply means don't set your hearts and minds on sin. But just the opposite. For you died... Meaning that when you were born again, you died to sin. You are now dead to sin. Look at where you are now. You are a person who is dead to sin. Yes, we're still tempted, but it's not. But now we have the Lord's help and we have the Lord's cleansing and the Lord's forgiveness. And so sin does not have power over us like it used to. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In other words, you've been clothed by Jesus. And that's Galatians 3.27. When we are baptized into Jesus Christ, where are we now? We are covered in him. We are clothed by him, the scripture says. It's according to what English translation you read there, but it uses the concept of being clothed. Verse 4. When Christ, who is your life. Notice that phrase. Christ, who is your life. Now, my friends, life comes from life. In other words, we could not have life if it were not for the life of Jesus Christ. And that's why he says, I came to give you life and give you life more abundantly. So Christ, who is your life, appears. And then you will also appear with him in glory. In other words, you will enjoy. Where are you now? Well, you've been, you're a new person. You've been raised again. You set your hearts on things above. You set your minds on things above. You realize that you have life Because life comes from Jesus Christ and he's coming back to get us one of these days and and when he will appear, uh, we will also appear with him in glory. Same thing is taught in John 3, 16. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so it's a very important point uh, that we realize where we are now as Christians. And then it's all right to take a look backward just to be reminded of where we have been. And so he does this with the Colossians. He, he starts out by saying, here's where you are now. You are a new person. But I want you to see how far you've come and where you've come from. Colossians 3 verses 5 through 11. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. In other words, stop the sinful lifestyle. And then he starts naming some things of the earthly nature. Sexual immorality, and that's the broad term, uh, which, uh, you know, it's like the word fornication. It's any kind of sexual activity that is sinful. Put that away. And then he talks about impurity, which means perversions. Uh, There is sexual immorality and then there are just perversions, things that are unnatural and and ungodly and just just so wrong. And then lust, he says, put that away. 
Um, he's going to say in just a moment that you used to live in these things. Lust, of course, means uh, the uncontrolled desire and evil desires and passion and greed, uh, which is idolatry. Verse 6, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Verse 7, you used to walk in these ways. Look at where you have been. You used to walk in these ways. Uh, in the life you once lived, verse 8, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, and anger there simply means a lingering or a lasting feeling. Uh, and then he talks about uh, rage, which is a, a quick temper. I, I finally got around to seeing the movie The Great Gatsby, the, the newest one, you know, with DiCaprio. And um, if you've seen the movie, you know the scene where he, he's, he has taught himself, even though he came from poverty and he came from a very, well, a struggling childhood. And then he left home and he became a f refined gentleman. He learned how to dress and he learned how to talk and he learned how to live in such a refined way. But he was so in love with this character, Daisy, in the movie uh, that at one point he just goes berserk and he just goes into it and then... It dawns on him that he has forgotten who he, who he has become. And he, and he settles down and he calms down and, you know, and he kind of fixes his hair. And he says, it seems that I have lost my temper. And he was so disappointed in himself for losing his temper. And so he's saying here, don't be the kind of people you used to be where you lived in a, a lasting, lingering anger and rage and malice, which means the intention to harm and slander, in other words, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's harmful speech, harmful words. And filthy language, he says, from your lips. Verse 9, he says, don't lie to each other. And since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self, can you change? Yes, you can. The Colossians had changed a great deal. And so can you and I. And he said, put on the, the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. In other words, that's Christian growth. Verse 11. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. Barbarian, which means the uneducated. In other words, those who did not speak Greek, for instance. Or the Scythian, or the slave, or the, the free. Uh, meaning uh, the, those who, uh, there were some who had legal rights and there were some who didn't have legal rights. But he says, but... Christ is all and is in all. In other words, everybody, no matter what your station in life, you, you used to live a certain way, but now you are a new creation. Remember where you've been and don't go back there and realize that everyone is held to the same standard of spiritual purity. You used to be, you used to have evil desires and evil behavior, but now you've been born again you're a new person, and so don't go back to where you've been. And then uh, look at well, uh, look at where we you need to be. So notice what he's saying. He says, "Here's where you are. Uh, look at that. Look at where you used to be. Then look back at where you are. You're a new person. And then look into the future at where you need to be, because there is progress to be made yet." Uh, you know, we sing the song, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. And so we, want, we, we need to realize that we are on a journey. And this journey is a journey where hopefully we're making progress day by day, week by week, month by month. And so he says, look at where you need to be. This is Colossians 3 verses 12 through 16. It's not where you've been, it's where you're going. So he says, put on Christian virtues. Verse 12, therefore... As God's chosen people. And it's very important to understand, and we talked about it in class this morning, that God had a plan from eternity to save a certain group of people. Who is in this group? Anyone and everyone who trusts in the Lord and obeys Him. Who, as believers, will repent of their sins, confess their faith in Jesus, receive baptism for forgiveness of sin. They are added to the church, which is God's family. And so, he says, you're God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with 
Compassion, that means you have a, a, a feeling of concern for other people. With kindness, and that's in the way you treat other people. Uh, with humility, in other words, not prideful. And with gentleness. And gentleness carries with it this idea of being a courteous person. And uh, I know all parents, hopefully, all parents uh, that are involved with Hickory know, we're teaching our children to be courteous, to say please, to say thank you, to be considerate of other people, uh, to not be uh, selfish, and, and so forth. And so that, that, that's all involved in being a kind and a gentle person, someone who does no harm. He, so he says, uh, embrace compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. He says, so look at where you need to be. Are you as patient as you need to be? Are you as compassionate as you need to be? Are you as kind? as you need to be? Are you as gentle as you need to be? Is there room in your life for spiritual growth like this? And then he says this, verse 13, bear with each other. In other words, put up with each other and, and give each other time to grow and to change. And some people grow faster than others and some people grow more slowly than others and and there is a there's a give and a take and there's a patience and there's an understanding and there's a brotherly love so we bear with each other and bear with each other also carries with it the idea uh, we we kind of run a little bit of interference so in other words we protect each other we take care of our own and and we we are we are supportive of each other because we are all members of God's family which is the church in other words we're on the same team and then he says this bear with one another forgive one and and, and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another uh, uh, and forgive as the lord forgave you verse 14 and over all these virtues where do you need to be over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. We sing a song, It is well with my soul. And that's really what the scripture is talking about when Paul is writing to the Colossians and he says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, rule in your soul. He's saying, have this get get to the place spiritually where you can honestly say or sing to yourself it is well with my soul i'm in a, a safe relationship with the lord i'm in a faithful relationship with the lord and i am going to stay in a faithful relationship with him and then he says and be thankful you were called to peace and be thankful and then he closes this by saying verse 16 let the word of christ Dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms. Now, psalms are songs, spiritual songs that are based on the Old Testament. Uh, maybe explicitly from the psalms or from some other like the song of Moses or something like that. And so he says, as you sing psalms based on the Old Testament and hymns, which are praise songs, praise to God the Father. Praise to God the Son. Praise to God the Holy Spirit as you sing psalms and as you sing hymns and as you sing spiritual songs. Now, what is a spiritual song? A spiritual song is a song that's based on Scripture. Because Jesus said the words I speak to you, John 6, 63, are spirit and life. And so a spiritual song is a song that teaches the truth. Uh, that honors God, that praises God, that reminds us of what the scripture teaches about certain things. For instance, we'll sing this song, Love One Another. Well, that's a spiritual song, Love One Another. Uh, and there's so many, Trust and Obey we'll sing. And we're teaching and admonishing one another uh, with that spiritual song because it's based upon scripture. And so he says, uh, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. In other words, Sing these songs with sincerity. And then the last look is look at the perfect example. Yes, we often and we always fail to be perfect. And yes, we are at a certain place right now. And we can look back to where we used to be before we were born again. 
And then we can look back at where we are. And then we look at where we need to be. And then finally, we lift our sights and we raise our vision. And then we put our eyes on the perfect example for everyone to follow. And so this is Colossians 3 verse 17. His Paul says, let me show you the standard. Let me show you. And, and one, of the, one of the ways, uh, one of the reasons why it's good for us to look at the standard who is Jesus is because it makes us realize that we need a Savior because we can't reach and keep that standard as perfect human beings. But again, we need to always keep our eyes on him. And so Paul draws down a principle here or lays down a principle instead of specifics. It's kind of like um, when he makes this statement I'm about to read, it's kind of like... Um, I was talking to a guy recently who has rental property. And uh, he was saying it doesn't do any good to have these long lists of things of do's and don'ts for people to sign. You know, uh, like, uh, you know, how they're going to keep the place up or whatever. He says, I get them to sign this document. But he says, I tell them. And he said, I look them in the eyes and I say, I want you to treat this place, whether it's an apartment or a rental house. I want you to treat this place as if it is your very own. Because people tend to take better care of their own property. So he's laying down a principle, my friend is, when he says it. And so Paul is laying down a principle. Instead of giving a long, long list of all the do's and don'ts of Christian living, he says this. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of that means by the authority and, and according to the blessing of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That means that everything we do should be done in submission and obedience to the Lord and to his honor and to his glory. And so Paul in Colossians chapter 3 is having the Colossian Christians to take a good look at themselves. Look at you. Listen at you. Look at where you are. Look at where you've been. Look at where you, you, you're going. Now look at where you need to be. And if you lose your way, then look to him. And he will keep you. He will get you back on track. And he will keep you going in the right direction. Okay, you see the plan of salvation on the screen. And most of us in this room tonight know this plan of salvation. You could recite it by heart. Uh, but God wants you to know, 1 Timothy 2, 4, that he wants you to be saved. And he, but he expects you and, does, and he demands that you believe in his son as your savior, repent of sin, confess faith in Jesus and receive baptism and commit to living faithful the rest of your life. By kneeling at the cross, that's just the, the poet's way in the song we're about to sing. We are basically saying that I cannot save myself. I need a savior and the only savior. There is no salvation under any other name except Jesus Christ, and so we kneel at the cross. If you need to kneel, spiritually speaking, at the cross tonight, this song is for you. And won't you come right now while together we stand and sing?